Yes, my name is Charles Sonigo. Um, I've been a software engineer for almost all my life, but I've also spent quite some years working as a data engineer. And today, uh, on behalf of Streamroot, I want to tell you a little bit about how to be data-driven when you are not Netflix, or even if you are, and I know we have some Netflix engineers in the room, you guys can stay, it's okay. So yeah, uh, why did I pick this subject? Mainly because um, I've been spending a lot of time reading uh, engineering blogs those last few years, especially the big video tech companies blog. And generally, I love the content, but it's always hard to put in practice in my slightly smaller company. Uh, and I think it's a general good uh, engineering problem to try and downscale big data processes like those guys used. And I like to formulate it like, how can I get X percent of the value that these guys are getting with only Y percent of the effort, X being as big as possible and Y being as small as possible. So let's dive in. No, first question, who amongst you knows uh, what Streamroot is? Can you raise your hand? I get a few people, okay, but you just want a little introduction. I'll be very quick. Uh, so basically, we, are, we provide uh, client-side video delivery optimization technology. Our main product is a WebRTC-based peer-to-peer uh, distributed solution. And basically, we enable uh, hybrid peer-to-peer -peer and CDN delivery. We have some other products uh, around uh, this sort of client-side optimization, like multi-CDN, uh, midstream switching on the client side, or ECDN for businesses. Uh, basically, the main goal of our product is to try, is to, try to help broad broadcasters reach uh, greater scale, uh, improve QoS, and reduce their cost. So, uh, yeah. So, what I'm going to say uh, is actually relevant, uh, and we've actually been working really hard on this, because today we are working with some of the big broadcasters all around the world. And we've actually reached uh, 20 million uh, unique sessions a day, and we have around 5 billion unique video sessions since the start of 2018. So it's good that we have all of this data, because our main goal was really to try and improve uh, quality of service for broadcasters. Uh, actually, the startup was founded because our found founders hated so much seeing buffering events during football games. And by that, I mean soccer. Yes, we are a French company. <laughs> OK, so I want to start with actually formulating the problem in a more general manner. Uh, so yeah, this is the problem that we were having, but I think our problem can apply also to you and most of you here. So the thing that you want to do is you want to try to improve uh, a piece of software that first has performance indicators that are highly dependent on environmental factors. And you guys all work in video here. You know that there is a lot of randomness around uh, the, the usage of our software, whether it be network conditions, whether it be the devices that your user are using, whether it be the bit rates, even the country and ISPs matter. So all of these factors actually hurt uh, to try and analyze how your software is behaving. Generally, second, uh, real-life conditions are almost impossible to accurately reproduce in a lab. Number three, most of your intuitions will be wrong, or at least mine tend to be. Uh, number four is actually optional, but in our case, we were, when we started, we were quite small, so we had a packed roadmap, and we had customer requests and features to release, so we needed to keep velocity. And the last one is the actual only technical requirement which is that you need to be able to randomize your software delivery at a user level. So basically, you need to be able to assign different versions of your software to different users to make that work. So we have been working towards enhancing QoS, uh, VIR, P2P, CDN hybrid delivery technology. But what I'm going to present to you today can apply as long as your piece of software follows those five criteria. So just a few examples that I could think of. Uh, on the client side, you could be working on UI, whether it be just changing the thumbnail for your content, whether it be adding a new quality picker or totally revamping your UI. Uh, you can actually use uh, the method I'm going to describe to improve that and make sure it actually improves the user experience. Uh, ABR improvement, this one is probably the toughest beast. And I'll let uh, Steven Robertson from YouTube talk to us a little bit later about how He's using machine learning to solve this one, but you can use simpler technique to actually make some progress with our peer-to-peer -peer, 
uh, incorporated delivery, we had to tweak the ABR, uh, and we spent like quite some time working on that. And we've, with the method, again, we've managed to reduce by a relative 20% the buffering ratio that we've seen in our global audience. Ads workflow also fall into that category, but you can also be working on backend logic. So just here are a few examples. We've been working on peer matching algorithms, of course, because that's uh, our main uh, core technology, I would say, but other examples work as well, as long as you're able to randomize your software among your users. So the good news is that basically you won't need an army of data scientists, our full-fledged A-B testing program, to start reaping the benefits of good data analysis and good data pipeline. So I want to start with how it all began for us, and I want to present to you the basic data pipeline or data lab that we've built uh, quite a few years ago. It's been upgraded since then, of course, but it's just to show you that with only uh, the one and a half engineers that we had at the time, we actually managed to reap out nice benefits out of this. So there is like four and a half main blocks that you will need uh, in your data pipeline. The first one is quite obvious, is that you're going to need to implement uh, some metrics around your software. You know your software better than me, but you need a lot of metrics. You're going to need uh, high-level metrics, like buffering ratio, the startup time, all these sort of metrics for us, but also deeper metrics, lower-level metrics that relate to your algorithms. This way, it's very interesting because you can see how the lower-level metrics will impact the higher-level metrics, and it's always good because it helps you monitor what's going on. You will, of course, need some sort of HTTP endpoint to send all of that. And by the way, uh, these metrics can be sent either by your user devices or by your servers. If, if your technology is on the backend side, this works just the same. Then you will need a message broker. I just want to mention Kafka here because we've been using it. Uh, it scales really well. Uh, it's really nice to use, and yeah, I love it. So I just wanted to give it a shout out. Um, and yeah, you need a message broker to basically centralize and distribute all of your messages in your different data processors. Data processor can be just basic enrichment, data validation, or pre-processing for more advanced uh, analysis that I will talk about later. The third block, which is actually really, really important, and people tend to overlook it, is a good analytics DB. It's basically some OLAP cube that will allow you to fastly uh, uh, explore your data set. Uh, you need to be able to drill across dimensions, filter all of that good stuff, uh, on large scale, at least for us, uh, and you need to do it fast so that you can actually explore without having to wait 15 minutes in between each of your queries. And here I just want to give a shout out to DruidDB, which is the one that we've been using for quite a long time, and that works really well. And uh, the last block, there's actually two things here. You're going to need some sort of tooling around your analytics DB. Now, in our case, we've been using open source tools on top of Druid uh, that will provide you nice and customizable dashboard where you can have a 360 views of all of your metrics that you can look at every morning when you come into the office. Uh, you need to be able to quickly look, okay, I want to look for this particular stream or this particular country. How is the QoS in our case, but whatever your metrics are, you need to be able to have a nice view, very accessible, that's very important. And also you will need some more advanced last mile analytics and advanced statistics services, but I will talk a little bit about that later. So uh, yeah, this is the basic data lab that we've been uh, using. We've upgraded a lot. Um, here are just a few of the improvements we've made over the years, uh, but based on your scale and also, very importantly, based on the engineers that you have. Uh, if you don't have that many engineers, then you might want to start small and easy. And if you have already like very experienced engineer, then you can go right to the the big stuff. So typically, we've been starting using Kubernetes to, um, to scale our data collection services. We've all of our data processing outside of Kafka are now done through Flink. Uh, also, we've added Hadoop. We had to at some point, and we've been using it with Avro. Uh, this is really nice because it helped us gain on storage and also made our data scientist team a little bit saner because they didn't have to struggle with uh, schema evolutions. And also, but there is like approximately a million blog posts about that. Uh, we use Zeppelin and PySpark on top of Hadoop to have uh, good velocity on the data science team to help the guys share the implementation between each other and basically to be able to do POC on complex analysis very fast. So yeah, this is the, th these are other tools that you could use to build your data pipeline. I don't want to go too much into details here. There's many solutions depending on your requirements. 
if you have any questions, please come and talk to me. Uh, I would be happy to tell you what I think should be the best option for you. So now that we've seen the infrastructure that you're going to need, let's talk a little bit about uh, the, method, the methodology that your engineers will need to follow if they want to improve the performance of your software step by steps without ever compromising on team velocity and feature releases. So there are two main processes that you need to know about. Uh, probably some of you already know about. They are not uh, rocket science. The first one is deployment A-B testing. And the idea is very simple. You just need to be able to give different versions of your software randomly uh, to your users. So in the case of a web uh, client-side uh, library, it's very easy. We use a reverse proxy. When a user requests the library, we have the reverse proxy deciding which version of the software it's going to give. And this way, we can do A-B testing on release. We can also do canary release and all of these nice things. The second process uh, that is very important is what I call configuration injection. Here again, the idea is simple. Whenever your software starts, it needs to request a configuration file from one of your server. And you can use this configuration file to actually uh, toggle feature on and off. And this is very, very useful because it allows you to then compare um, to actually look at the effect of each feature individually without having a release com like containing like five different features that you're going to struggle to analyze. So with these two processes, you can now start to, uh, to go into the nice methodology that will allow you to never, uh, what did I say before, to never compromise on team velocity while still improving your software step by step. So how does it go? We start with V1 in production. It's working well, or at least decently well. And it's deployed to 100% of the production. Now we have a V2 that's just out of QA. Apparently, it seems to be OK. We have some new features that are toggled uh, through configuration injection, like I uh, mentioned before. The first step uh, that you guys probably all know about is doing a canary release. And this is nice because it will help you detect major regressions. At these steps, we don't do full uh, data analysis. We just look for all of the playback errors and all of the big regression that we don't want to see. If we see any, of course, we roll back and we fix. Then we move on. Once we are quite confident and there's no big regression, that we're not going to break playback for anybody, we release uh, the V2 on 50% on, uh, of the traffic. And I call that the AA prime uh, testing because the V2 has all of the new features toggled off. So it should theoretically behave exactly like the V1. And this is what we're going to want to test. Because for instance, even if you made a change that's toggled off, like let's say you added a screen in screen feature for your player. These sorts of features tend to bring in some refactoring with them, and you can never know that uh, this big refactoring that you did just didn't introduce a little regression. So you want to really make sure, even when toggled off, that everything behaves the same. If it's not behaving the same, you roll back and you try and fix it. Once you're confident that it's behaving the same, you can release it to 100% of your production. And this is where it gets interesting you will be able to, uh, to start activating these five features that you implemented one by one through configuration injection. So generally what we do is we do start with 5% of the, of, uh, of the users with a new feature. We look at the effect. If it's OK, we try on 50%. And then we can compare completely and uh, deeply the effect of the feature. If it's good, we keep it. If it's not that good, or at least not what we thought it would be, we can rethink. Uh, the feature, maybe rework it a little bit. And if it's just bad, we just plainly throw it away. And after that, the cycle starts again, of course. So this is the methodology of release, I would say. Now I will look a little bit into uh, the sort of data analysis that you're going to want to apply to this uh, cycle of release uh, and sort of the basic traps uh, that data uh, will present to you and the, the, how you can avoid falling into those traps. So sorry for the data scientists here. There are going to be some very basic stuff here, but it's always a good reminder. So one-on-one -on -one outliers, that's not news. Uh, they are everywhere. Uh, they will be in your data sets. The only thing I want to mention is please be careful. Uh, don't just filter them out. Some of them actually highlight some actual problems. For instance, here we're looking on the on the y-axis at a rebuffering ratio uh, over time, and each point is actually a session, we can see there is some negative values, which definitely need to be filtered out. 
but we also have some 100% rebuffering values, and these kind of people are the people who are, who, for, for whom playback didn't start. And when we see this kind of behavior increase, of course, we're going to want to investigate quickly and see where the problem is coming from. So outliers also bring their share of information, and you, do, you need to monitor them a little bit. One or two. Um, those two are very close to my heart because they are so easy to miss. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Simplon paradox and the count founding factors. So basically, these are the type of things that uh, can make you have completely wrong conclusion about the data you are looking at. So in this example, we've implemented two different peer-to-peer -peer data exchange protocol, one that's very UDP-like and one that's very TCP-like, and we A-B test by toggling uh, the new one, which was the TCP one, we A-B test and to look at the effect. And when you look at that, well, it's pretty obvious, 15 million sessions on each side. We have 1.5% more traffic offload, which is our key metric in terms of peer-to-peer -peer delivery. So we think, OK, UDP is just better. Cool, let's just keep it. But if we look a little bit closer and we now split the traffic uh, for live and for VOD, this doesn't stay true at all. So for live, the UDP is still winning by actually 3%, a little bit more than we initially thought. But for VOD content, the TCP-like is actually way better. We have 5% more uh, offload, which is great. And these sort of things happen all the time. It's, uh, you just have to be careful. You just have to look and split uh, across the dimension that you know. And I don't have anything about the count founding factors here, but the idea is also very simple. You're looking at, at your data set. You see, OK. Whenever I have A, I have also B, so that must mean that A causes B. Pretty simple, right? But actually, there is this C variable that you didn't look at that causes both A and B. And so you start thinking, OK, uh, I'm going to like rewrite my software to take into account that A causes B, but you're totally wrong. You just had to look at C, which was the main cause of, uh, of everything. And so those two simple paradox and confounding factors, how can you actually try and fight them? Well, there's no textbook method to do that. Uh, you can only stay vigilant. Uh, you have to always ask yourself every time you reach a conclusion, does this conclusion still apply to all of the subsets of my data set? Uh, is there a lurking company factor that I could have missed? And generally, it, that keeps you up at night. Uh, after a little while, like, uh, you start seeing confounding factors everywhere. But uh, you know, that's the life of a data engineer, I guess. Uh, and also, yeah, it's good to monitor generally the overrepresented groups in your audience because those can have actually a pretty big impact on those sort of uh, simple paradox, for instance. Next, uh, one of three, it's really simple as well. Histograms, they are really good. Uh, stop looking at averages. I mean, you can if you want, if you are on the business side, but uh, on the data side, we tend to avoid looking at averages. For instance, here uh, we are looking at distribution of buffering ratio. Uh, for, different, um, for two different browsers, actually. And uh, they have the actual same average. Uh, and this is because one of them has like a little percentage of people who have 100% rebuffering ratio. So I won't name this browser, but it does. Uh, and so you could think, OK, those two browsers are the same regarding buffering ratios, but they are totally not. Uh, one of them, yes, has a lot of people having 0% buffering, but it also has like a nice, like, portion of the user who are completely frozen, so that's pretty bad. Next, let's go to my public enemy number one, which is noise. So noise, you probably already heard the term. Uh, it's the thing that makes everything annoying, basically. So on this graph, I'm looking at uh, two configurations that are exactly the same. So it's basically, I just took my users, split in two, and then measured the traffic, uh, the peer-to-peer -peer offload that I'm seeing with them. And you can see that the two curves are actually quite close. They are kind of following each other, but not totally right. And if I did another split, so I just took this half, if I took that half, then I would get different curves every time. And it's annoying because uh, we know that the law of large numbers tells us that if we look at the total aggregated results, those two will converge. And they will, actually, uh, trust me. Uh, they, they tend to do really well. But we don't have all the time in the world, and we're trying to you know, release things on a regular basis, so we have timings. We need to be able to set a date for when the, experience, the experiment has to stop. Um, so yeah, and this is in the case of two identical configurations. If you have two different configurations and you start to see those curves, when do you go like, okay, 
it actually had an effect. Uh, there is some differences. So how do you distinguish something that's just random noise to something that's actually an effect of a change that you brought into your software? So for that, there's not a million way to look at it. You have to look at statistical significance. Uh, so there is a lot of literature on the subject. Um, it really depends on how you design your experiments. We have been using what's called the chi-square test for quite a while at Streamroot. Uh, it's really nice because it doesn't cost too much CPU to do. And the best thing about it is you can streamline a pre-processing step that will then allow you to run the test on any subgroups uh, of your total audience. So that's really nice, actually, uh, because sometimes you don't really know in advance what filter you're going to want to apply uh, to, for your experiment. But so it also comes as a very high memory usage, both RAM and storage, for the pre-processing step. And uh, yeah, cardinality hurts really fast as well. If you have really high cardinality di dimension, you're going to need to cherry pick uh, some of them and like only look at some of them because otherwise uh, it starts to be really intensive. So let me try and go a little bit into the case crop tests. I won't go into the formula. Please feel free to take a picture. But the general idea is actually simple. So we have two variables. First, the label of our groups. Second, uh, a certain metric x. So for instance, I like to always pick the buffering ratio because it's the one I'm always monitoring. So we want to see if those two metrics are independent or if they are dependent, meaning that if the label has actually an effect on the buffering ratio. So the chi-square statistic is just a bunch of math that you can try and look, basically. Uh, but the nice thing about it is that if the two metrics are totally independent, then we actually know in advance the distribution of the chi-square uh, statistics. And this is what we call the null hypothesis. And in that case, it's nice because so we, we have this known in advance if the, metri if the variables were independent uh, distribution, and we can compare it to the distribution we observe in production. And by comparing those two, we can actually uh, get a probability that what we are looking at is an actual uh, real effect and not just noise. So I'm going to try and give you a little bit of a more concrete example of how that works and how you can actually get a feel of what's going on. So as inputs, I will take a metric, so always my good buffering ratio. And I will take a range of values, which is going to be from 0 to 20. You don't really see it on the graph, but believe me, it goes to 0 to 20%. We don't look at the above values because there's no one there. Uh, also, uh, we pick two group of users. In that case, we also picked two browsers, two different browsers. So I will call them the red browsers and the blue browser, and some filters. Um, in our case, we filter at startup time from buffering because we tend to look at startup time separately from the rest of the buffering. So this is our inputs. And so this graph just shows you how many people are buffering how many, basically. So. The first bucket is the 0% buffering uh, bucket. So you can see that the Blue Brothers has a lot of people who do no rebuffering. And uh, yeah, the Red Brothers a little less. But then uh, yeah, everything starts to, to go to 0 after like 10%. Uh, then this is the a little bit complicated part. But you have to. this is what I call population movement or practical significance. And you can think about that as just being the difference between the two previous histograms. So here, if you take the blue and you subtract the red, you get the blue stack that you see on the first bucket. And it goes the same for all of the other. If you take the second bucket, the red minus the blue, it will give you a negative value. And so this is the sort of thing that you see. So this is a just neat way of visualizing the differences between two distributions. And so there's a lot of information on this graph. I'll just go very quickly through it. Uh, first, you have some test metadata, so it will give you your p-value, which is this famous probability of, that, of uh, is this an actual change. Uh, you'll have some information about how many samples you have, all of that good stuff. You will also have, uh, what do I want to say? Yep. On the axis, so you have on the x-axis the buffering ratio. So the little red values that you see are the limits of each bucket. And on the y-axis, you will have the actual displacement of population. So it's actually repeated below. You can see the first bucket is 35% displacement. And what does that mean? It means that basically, if the blue browsers had 80% uh, of its users having zero buffering, it means that the red browsers will have 
80 minus 35, and that is 45%. So this is really nice because it gives you actually a feel of what is the effect. So it not only tells you, OK, this is an actual effect. Your p-value is very small, so there is a very, very high chance that you introduced a change, which is the case for two different browsers, of course. There is a big change. But it also gives you a feel of, OK, where is the change happening? So in that case, we can see that we took some people that had like relatively high buffering, and we pushed them to the zero, which is great. And there is a final visualization that I want to show you as well, uh, which is exactly for the same experiment. It's just this time shows you for each bucket uh, how each of the population movement impacted uh, the total probability, the total p-value, uh, so the probability that what you saw was a change. So it's also nice because in that case, well, it's two different browsers, so we know that there is an actual effect. But most of the time, it's not that clear, and these sort of visuals can help you uh, more like understand where, um, which population actually had a big impact on the probability that this was an actual change. So that was all I wanted to show you, just a little bit uh, about what we are planning to, what we are working on at the moment, and what we are planning to do next. Uh, we really want to experiment a little bit, bit more with the statistical significance of visualization. We want to try and use quantile functions and resampling to try and cross-check the result that we've been seeing with the chi-squared. And um, yeah, we've been also working on some clustering algorithm to try and cluster user based on how they interact with our tech. And finally, we've also been working on some uh, machine learning uh, to try and optimize the client configuration, so the configuration that was injected, and try to find the best configuration for each client. Thank you, everybody. And, uh